All right, uh, page 43, here's what we're going to do. This last session, I want to talk specifically about your programming culture. Your programming culture. Um, you're known in your community based on your programming, right? People think about your children's programming, your student programming. They hear that you have a good youth group. Um, they know about what you do on Sunday morning, your style of music and all that kind of stuff. And essentially, you're, there's a way, one way of thinking about your church, and this seems a little um, dry, but your church is really in some ways a conglomeration of ministry environments, of ministry programming environments. And that's the word we use a lot instead of programming. We talk about environments, and we're going to talk specifically about that today. So your church is basically a conglomeration of environments from worship service environment, your children's environment, your middle school environment, your Saturday night service environment, whatever it might be. And so all of those environments are being um, led by, in, in many cases, volunteers, in some cases, staff with volunteers. And the challenge, as you know, is these staff and volunteers all show up with a different standard of what makes an environment a good environment. They show up with a different standard of excellence. Most of them came from other churches, and they know how student ministry is supposed to be. They know how worship is supposed to be. They know what Sunday morning is supposed to feel like. They know how to hand out a bulletin. Nobody needs to tell me to do that. So people come from different churches. They come into your environment, and they're helping you create environments but as a senior leader or as a student pastor or as the children's director you in your mind and your head you know how this is supposed to look and you know how this is supposed to feel so you're constantly evaluating your environments and if you're a senior pastor you're evaluating all the environments in your organization and sometimes you give them an A and sometimes you give them a C and sometimes you get so frustrated you think we just need to get a new high school director because he or she doesn't know what they're doing and so we're constantly evaluating but the, the, the problem is oftentimes we're all evaluating from a different list of what makes a great environment a great environment. So my goal in our last session today is twofold. Number one, I want to challenge you. I want to challenge you to sit down, if you haven't done this already, and clearly, 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 clearly define what makes a great programming environment so that it's clear to you, so that you can transfer that to the people that you work with, so that when you evaluate their work, you're evaluating them from something they knew about ahead of time, instead of just walking the hall saying, well, that felt good, and that seemed a little sloppy, and I'm not sure about that. Then you get complaints from parents, or you get complaints from people in the church, and of course, they've all evaluated what you're doing, and they're evaluating from different standards. But if you're able to say to your staff and to your volunteers, here's what we think makes a great children's ministry. Here's what we think makes a great Great student ministry. Um, in, our, in our book, The Seven Practices of Effective Ministry, we talk about clarifying the win. That's a part of this. Clarifying the win is asking the question on the, at the end of Sunday, or Sunday when we go home from children's ministry, when we go home from a worship service, what is it we want to say that we were able to accomplish? What was the win? So for us, we have literally sat down with every single ministry environment and asked the question, what is the win or what are the wins? And in every single ministry environment, they can show you three short statements. Here's the win for children's ministry. Here's the win for student ministry. Here's the win for service programming. You know, here's the, here's the win in every area so that everybody in every area knows exactly what we're trying to accomplish. Because the clearer the target, the more likely it is they're going to hit it. Now, so consequently, this means um, a lot of meetings. A lot of discussion, a lot of arguing back and forth. It requires a lot of um, wordsmithing so that everybody comes to the place where they can say, this is exactly what we're trying to accomplish. You've clarified the win, and there's a bunch of stuff in that chapter section of the book um, specifically about that. Um, but So what I want to do is take a subset of that broader category of clarify the win, and I want to give you what we feel like for us, and this is my second goal today, give you what we feel like for us is sort of the litmus test for what makes a great ministry environment. Now, it's just three things, and it's our list, and you don't have to adopt our list, but I want to go through our list because I want to challenge you to come up with your own. And these are so crystal clear to us that I feel like, especially if you're thinking about, about multi-campus, this is even more important for you, that we have a tool that allows us to bring a consistent experience, and that's what you want, that's allowed us to bring a consistent experience to all our student ministry environments, all our children's ministry environments, not just on a campus, but across all the campuses. And it's given us a tool so that when we get all our staff in together to evaluate the effectiveness, the effectiveness of a ministry or a ministry environment, we're all kind of singing off the same page. And best of all, we're able to sit down with volunteers on day one and say, here's exactly what we're doing, and here's exactly how we evaluate success in this particular arena. Now, 
Before we jump into these things, one of the pushbacks through the years that I've gotten whenever I've talked about this, and I, this is something I absolutely love to talk about, it's a little bit meat and potatoes, it's a little bit nut and, nuts and bolts, it's not you know, super you know, crazy creative, it's just kind of foundational. Sometimes the pushback is, well, Andy, we don't really need to do that at our church because we're not like you, we're not, attra we're not like an attractional model. We're not just always trying to attract new people to children's ministry. We're not constantly trying to attract new people to our church. And you're, you're so marketplace focused, you're so consumer driven, you're so growth oriented, and that's not really who we are. So if that's your pushback, my response is we are unapologetically growth oriented and we are unapologetically come and see oriented and we're up unapologetically attractional. And, and the reason is, or part of the reason is, it's because we think everybody spends forever somewhere. And, you know, I've never seen an empty seat make a decision for Christ, whether it's in children's ministry, high school ministry, middle school ministry, college ministry, or on Sunday morning. So, heck, yeah, we want to be attractional. Heck, yeah, we want to be irresistible. And, you know, you open the New Testament, and you, one of the a couple of great stories around that whole idea, if you want to teach this to your people, is Nathaniel finding his brother, remember? And he said, just come and see. If you can just come and see. The woman at the well went into the sick car and said, just come and see, just come and see. I can't explain it. I can't answer the questions. Just come and see. And we think our philosophy is when the body of Christ is hitting on all eight cylinders, you know, or 12 or how many cylinders we have, when the body of Christ is being the body of Christ, whether it's in worship, in middle school, in high school, in teaching God's word, that when unbelievers and unchurched people come and see, when we're getting it right, they tend to stick and they tend to want to come back. In fact, the win, the win for Sunday morning for us in our worship services, the win, the win is when a 35 to 50 something year old man who is antagonistic toward church comes here either by himself or his wife or kids have dragged him in here and he sits on the back row and he at the end of the service he says to himself, I don't think I believe everything they believe, but I enjoyed that, that was helpful, I wanna come back next week. That's our win for Sunday morning. We want it to be the man, we want it to be that guy who's kind of way too cool for school, and kind of, you know, I'm not really a church person, that's for women and children, but I'm gonna be here under duress, but you know what, and I don't think I believe everything, but you know what, that was helpful, I got something out of it, I think I'll come back next week. That's how attractional we wanna be. So, as I give you our model and explain our criteria for what we think are irresistible ministry environments, yes, we are trying to attract people. Yes, we're trying to get people to stick. We just think that people live forever somewhere and we need to do everything as we can as a local church um, to make them stick. So, in your notes, here's the three, we call them the three essential ingredients. I'll go through these, give you some illustrations, and then we'll wrap up our day together. Here we go, three essential ingredients for irresistible ministry environments roman numeral one an appealing setting an appealing setting by setting i'm talking about the physical environment the physical environment in which ministry takes place is extremely important letter b settings create first impressions you know that but don't forget that Settings, the physical setting of ministry, whether it's your campus lawn, it's your classrooms, it's the hallways, all of that sets or creates a first impression. Letter C, an uncomfortable or distracting setting can derail ministry before it even begins. An uncomfortable or distracting setting can derail ministry before it begins. An extreme example of this, and you probably have your own, is one day I'm on the baseball field uh, watching my son, one of my sons play, and the coach walks up, who I just met, and he said, um, Andy, he said, after my daughter died, he said, I haven't been able to go back to church, haven't been to church in 13 years. I thought, I, I had no idea what he was talking about. I just met this guy. He's, and all of a sudden, he's telling me about his daughter died, he hadn't been to church in 13 years. I, I, we're in the middle of a conversation. He's emotional. I'm like, okay, was I supposed to have already known this? I mean, I just met this guy. Long story short, grew up Catholic, went to Catholic church. His daughter, you know, was, I think, two or three weeks or maybe two or three months old, um, she dies. It was obviously a horrible, horrible situation. He had a son who was uh, a little bit older. And, um, and so I, I said, was it because you're mad at, you know, I'm like, are you mad at God? Why don't you go back to church? He said, oh, no, no, no. He said, because every time I walk into the church and I look at the altar, all I can see in my mind's eye is that little itty bitty, cas my little bitty casket on the altar down at the front of the church. And I haven't been able to go back to church. And none of my kids have been to church because I can't bear to go back to church. The physical, I mean, it's extreme. The physical environment kept him out. I said, I've got some great news. Lou, we don't have an altar. 
We don't have a table down front. You won't even feel like you're in church. He said, really? And he came here, and a few months later, I was able to baptize, baptize Lou. But it was, just, it was just the physical environment. Now, that's extreme. But you know what? To some extent, all of your physical environments say something. All of them send a message. Some of the messages we planned, some of them are unintentional. Letter D, every physical environment communicates something. There are no neutral physical environments. Every physical environment communicates something. Um, a new friend of mine has got a church out west. I was visiting him, and he, he, was, when he said, when I first came to this church, he said, I walked in the foyer, and it's full of flowers. He said, there's flowers everywhere. He said, and I walked in, and I, I, he said, I, I, you know, he was new. He was trying to figure out who brings all these flowers, and it was a committee, and they always have a beautiful, you know, new bouquet and this, all these flowers. He said, you know, he said, it was, Andy, to be honest, it was just so feminine. He said, I said, we're going to get rid of the flowers. He said, I went down to the local Harley dealership, and I asked the guy, I said, hey, would you charge me anything to park two brand new Harleys in the foyer of our church Sunday? The guy's, heck no. And so sure enough, he said, I, he said, I started putting Harley Davidsons in the foyer of the church. He said, and when I walk in the foyer of the church, who's standing around? Who's standing around? Men. Uh, motorcycle. <clears throat> now, I, I thought that was, that was pretty radical. And so he just lets them showcase Harley Davidson. So the guys, first, they, you know, they want to go to the church. Why? Because every ministry environment communicates something. And if we can remember that and learn to leverage even the physical. See, we think in terms of content and the Bible and Jesus, and we'll get to that in a minute. But the physical plant, the physical environment, all of it communicates something. There are no neutral physical environments. For example, in your notes, clean. If your environment's clean, it communicates we were expecting you. Let me ask you this, when is your home the cleanest? And you're expecting guests, right? Right, your church, your church on Sunday morning, on Saturday night, whenever you have services, it should be like your house when you're expecting guests because hopefully you're expecting guests. And clean says we were expecting someone. Organized, organized communicates we're serious about what we're doing. We're serious about what we're doing. You ever gone to like a first national bank? I mean, you know why it's marble and tight and there's hardly any sheetrock and everything's clean lines? It's because they want you to walk into that foyer of that big bank and think, wow, these folks are serious. I can trust them with my money. Disorganization. Disorganization communicates we're not all that serious. Disorganization communicates we're kind of random. Doesn't really matter. The physical environment. Now, remember. If all you're trying to do is attract church people, this isn't all that important. If you're First Presbyterian Church and you're just trying to get all the Presbyterians that move into your area, this isn't all that important. If you're First Baptist Church and you're just trying to get the Baptists that move into your area because they don't know any better because they went to the Baptist Church in their old town, now they're going to the Baptist Church, this isn't all that big a deal. But if you're trying to capture the imagination of people who don't normally go to church, then you better believe it's got to be clean because that says we were expecting you and it needs to be organized because that says we're serious about what we're doing. I put a quote in there from one of our favorite books around here, The E-Myth. Just curious, how many of you have read The E-Myth? I'm just curious. Yeah, a bunch of you. This was one of the first books we read as a staff. We've come back to this book twice. I bet you know three quarters of our staff have had a small groups around The E-Myth. Here's a quote from The E-Myth. A business that looks orderly says to your customer that your people know what they're doing. It's a big deal right there. An organization or that looks orderly a business or organization or church that looks orderly, it, it's, there's a message there. It says, we know what we're doing. Safe, third word. Safe says, we value your kids the way we value our own. Now, I don't know about your community, but in this community, people worship their children. They worship, I mean, children, I mean, it, they worship their children. That's why we have to put little things up there and give people buzzers and beepers. We got, it's okay. You know, he's not going anywhere. She's not going anywhere. Now, you can either resist that and say, well, they ought to trust us. Or you can play to it and say, you know what I say to our church? I say, I want you to know something. Wombaland, safest piece of real estate in Fulton County. That hallway back there, set, your kids may not learn a thing, but I'm telling you, it's the safe. Because they don't care if their babies learn anything. It is the safest piece of real estate in Fulton County. You put your kids back there, oh my gosh, it's, you, there is no safer place. Why? That's what kids, that's what parents want to know. You say, well, should we play to that? And, and again, we get pushed back on this. Aren't you consumer-oriented? Yes. I've never met a non-consumer. Every human I've ever been eyeball to eyeball with is a consumer. Of course we're consumer oriented. And yes, we're going to play to their consumer instincts. So did Jesus. Do you think people came to hear Jesus for his sermons? Uh-uh. They couldn't understand half his sermons. 
I don't understand half of his sermons. I've got commentaries. You don't know, you tell me you can read those parables and tell me what all that meant. The kingdom of God is like a woo. You know why people came to see Jesus? He fed them and he healed them. Why? Because they were consumers and he was meeting a need. Now, is that good or bad? No, it's just a thing. So heck yeah, if I can get an unchurched person to feel better about putting their kids back in Wombo Land by telling them how safe it is, not only are we gonna make it safe, we're gonna tell them. It's safe. So these are big deals. These are big deals. Letter D. <clears throat> Design decor and attention to detail communicate what and who you value most. Now, I'm just telling you, this is huge. I could walk onto your church property and tell you what and who you value the most. When you walk up and down these halls, you know that we value children because we're like children crazy with all of our facilities, right? Uh, your church facility has a message. Now, you've been there for so long. It goes back to what I said early this morning. The longer you're in it, the less aware you are of it. You may not be aware of what your church facility communicates, but it communicates something, and it communicates what and who is most important to you. Um, we've, Sandra and I visited a really, really large church about two years ago, and they had like state-of-the-art worship center. And I, between services, I said, I'd love to tour your children's facilities. And the pastor and the pastor wife kind of looked at each other, and the pastor's wife said, well, it's not like you guys do it. I said, what? She goes, well, you know, so we toured their children's area, and they were awful. I mean, they, were, they seemed like they weren't clean. They had these old, big monitors. It was just, it was just, it just told us, you know what? They value worship for adults. They don't value children's ministry. Why? Because I could tell where they put their money. So your facility tells people what and who you value. And if you're in a community where people worship their children, you can complain all day long and preach messages about how you shouldn't worship your children, but they're not going to come to your church. So you just got to decide. Are you in it for the growth? Are you in it to reach people? Are you in it maybe just to make a point that nobody's going to pay attention to? Anyway, letter F. And by the way, I kind of worship my children, so I'm kind of in there with you. Okay, um, letter F. Design decor and attention to detail communicate whether or not you're expecting guests. This is huge. Um, we have a saying around here that the sermon begins in the parking lot. You know, one of the reasons we put lots of people out in the parking lot with orange vests is it because people don't know how to park? Okay, then you don't have parking and attendance at the mall. People know how to park. The reason we have people in the parking lot is because it says we were expecting you. We're expecting guests. We want you to have a great experience, not just in here. We want you to have a great experience out there. Our, all of our church plants, every time we do a church plant, we say, you got to have people in the parking lot. Uh, it's not that people don't know how to park. It's that what you do in the parking lot says we are expecting guests. It's part of the physical plant. Um, I'll skip all those. Letter G. Periodically, this is true for all of us, periodically, we all need fresh eyes on our ministry environments. Periodically, we all need fresh eyes on our ministry environments. And the reason that's the case, and again, it goes back to what we said this morning, after a while, we just don't see stuff anymore. We don't see things that shouldn't be the way they are. Sandra and I recently, um, her grandmother died, she was 100 years old, and um, she left her several thousand dollars in, in her will, not a whole lot of money, but you know, several thousand dollars, a lot of money. So I said, well, darling, you know what? You should take that money and buy something to help you remember your grandmother. And so I had some suggestions. She didn't like any of my suggestions, okay? Because I thought grandmama always wanted a convertible, but she said no, she didn't. Anyway, and there wasn't enough money to buy a convertible anyway. So I had lots of suggestions about what grandmama liked. In fact, for months, it was like, you know, I think grandmama would really like us. So anyway, Sandra decided what she wanted to buy with grandmama's inheritance money was a new, um, di not dining room, but a kitchen table, a round kitchen table that we could put six chairs around, a big, nice, beefy wood, awesome, cool table, you know. So she goes down to the mart, and she gets a discount on the wholesale. So we get this thing. It's expensive, I think, for a table. So we get this table, and they were selling the chairs half price, and then it was discounted again. So now we walk in, and we have the—and it is an awesome table and awesome chairs. And I looked at it, and about three days ago, I said, you know what? I said, I think our other table and chairs were super ugly, and we didn't know it. I think that people who had any kind of fashion or decorator sense would come to our house and look at our, our kitchen table and chairs and go, hmm. But we, but we know what? We had it two houses ago, and then we moved it to another house. This is the third house, so it's our table and it's our chairs. We think it's awesome. We don't even see it. But I think anybody that's been coming to our house for the last 10 years kind of glanced over there like, that's a little small for the room, and the, what's the, with the color? Because now we got the, you know, the Mac Daddy awesome table. Well, the thing is, all of us, 
All of us, I don't care how long you've been there. In fact, the longer you've been there, the worse. All of us need fresh eyes on our ministry environments because some of us can see it and some of us can't, but I tell you who sees it immediately. Who sees it? Who notices the bad stuff immediately? The who people? The new people. Yeah, the new people are the people that walk in and go, whoa, has anybody been in that room? And whoa, well, put my child in there if it's the last place, you know, and whoa, do they, do they vacuum? Do they paint? Do they not know you can buy paint? You know, the, the new people notice all of that stuff. It's invisible to us. So every once in a while, you need to bring somebody in to put fresh eyes on your children's ministry, your walls, your decor, your landscape, everything. Because again, the longer we're there, the more worthless we are when it comes to it. Um, there's a, just a little help with this for some of you you know there's basically two kind of people in the world there are people who see a mess and there are people who don't see a mess you know this we learned this with babysitters right you get home we had three little kids you know and the, the, we can see we know everything they did while we were gone because there's the pizza box and they played over there with those toys and they played over there with those toys and then they drank coca-cola over there and they watched that on television we can just we know everything that happened and we get there and the babysitter's like oh we had such a nice time we've had babysitters we would start cleaning up our own house while the babysitter told us what happened and didn't even didn't even think to help us clean up all the mess but you know why she didn't clean up the mess she didn't see it it's she it's it, messes are invisible to her other babysitters you get home everything's immaculate why do they see a mess now some of you are mess seers and some of you aren't and those of you who aren't you need to discover that you aren't and you need to give somebody permission who is to trail around behind you and make sure you don't have messy ministry environments. And I'm going to tell you right now how to know whether or not you can see a mess or you can't, okay? And it's going to hurt some of your feelings, okay? When you go out to your car <laughs> or when you get home, I want you to look in the back seat of your car. And if you got stuff in there from two or three days ago and there's an empty cup and there's an empty can or somebody, if you want to give somebody a ride and every time you give somebody a ride, you have to say, excuse me while you throw stuff into the back. Have I hit a nerve down here on the fifth row? <laughs> then you know what? You know, seriously, God bless you. Jesus loves you going to heaven when you die. But you need somebody that will make sure you don't accidentally leave a mess everywhere you go because you don't see it. Because here's the deal. You know who's going to see it? The guest. The new people, they're going to see it. So physical plants important. So here's three questions you can talk about in the van going home or when you get home or with your team. Number one, are your ministry settings appealing to your target audience? Are your ministry settings, the physical environment, appealing to your target audience? Does the design, decor, and attention to detail of your ministry reflect what and who is most important to you? If children are important to you, it needs to look like it. You know, if adults, if small groups are important to you, it needs to look like it. What's important to you? Is there a way to make your physical plant look like what's important to you is actually important to you? And then number three, what's starting to look tired? What's starting to look tired? See, this is a tough one because the longer you're there, nothing looks tired. This is the way it's always been. In fact, we like it that way. In fact, I know how that hole got in the wall. It has, I have fond memories of that. What's starting to look tired? Now, Last thing on this, pastors, senior pastors, senior leaders, okay? Let me just, this is just my opinion. And I tell our campus pastors this all the time. We're one big organization with, you know, six or five, you know, ch big churches in Atlanta area. But I tell our campus pastors, and I, I want to tell you what I tell them. I say, look, guys, you should be proud of everything at that campus. You should be proud of everything in that campus. If there's something on that campus, on that facility that bugs you and you're not proud of, you need to fix it, address it, or find out why it can't be fixed or addressed. Don't walk by stuff and go, well, yeah, but you know, that's preschool. No, 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 no. You need to be proud. If there's any part of your building or anything, any ministry environment that you would be embarrassed if your neighbor came to church and showed up there, it's like, oh, you didn't go down there, did you? Then you need to address that. You need to address it. And you need to feel it. And if you don't feel it, you need to have somebody around you that has permission to say, Pastor, I know that kind of stuff doesn't bother you, but I'm telling you, that wall needs to be repainted. That wing needs to be shut down. That carpet needs to be replaced. Are you kidding me with these colors? You know what? And again, and I know what you're thinking, money, 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 money. It's going to be expensive. Hey, all I'd say is this. At least have the discussion. At least get it priced out and at least start talking about it. Don't let how much it might cost keep you from at least taking a step toward paying attention to the details of your physical plant. Because your ministry environments all take place somewhere physically and the physical plant, the physical environment creates and sends a message every single time. Now, for some of you, and I'm with you, this isn't naturally a big deal to you. 
You've got other people that have been bugging you, bugging you, bugging you. They keep putting it in the budget. You take it out of the budget. They put it in the budget. You take it out of the budget. And you say things like this. Well, what spiritual difference is it going to make if we have a mural on the wall? And the answer is it's not going to make any spiritual difference. But you need to communicate something to people who aren't insiders. You need to communicate something to outsiders. That children are important to us. Students are important to us. It's a big deal to us. We're serious about this. So again, this is a big deal. It's part of the ministry environment. So first question we ask, is the setting appealing? Is the setting appealing? Is this an appealing setting in light of what we want to do? Second question is this. Are the, are the presentations engaging? Or the second component is an engaging presentation. An engaging presentation. And en engaging presentations are central to the su success of our mission. Here's why. Number one, because present presenting the gospel is a primary responsibility of the church. We are in the presentation business. Our mission is to present the gospel, whether it's through what we say, what we show, or how we live our lives. We are presenters. All of us are presenters. So consequently, all of our presentations need to be as engaging as we can possibly make them. Number two, teaching them to obey everything I've commanded you is the unique responsibility of the church. Teaching them from the Great Commission everything I've commanded you, it is our unique responsibility. So consequently, if we're presenting, and if we're presenting unique information, and we believe we're presenting eternally unique information, then we need to just gear up big time on how well we do in terms of presentations. Letter B, to engage simply means to secure one's attention. To engage or to have an engaging presentation is simply to ensure one's attention. So when we started North Point, we decided, and Reggie Joyner was here earlier. I don't know if he's still here now. And, you know, Reggie does rethink and is training children's leaders and student pastors and people all over the country. It's awesome. We still do a lot of things together. But he was part of our original team, and we decided, look, let's just be crazy when it comes to presentations. Let's have no, no, no tolerance for bad presentation. Let's just decide up front, we're going to hurt people's feelings. We're going to run off volunteers. We're going to make people mad. We're going to tell people that think they know what they're doing. They don't know what they're doing. But we are not going to bore children. We are not going to bore middle schoolers. We are not going to bore high schoolers. We're not going to bore small groups. We're not going to bore grown-ups with the scripture. We're just not. We're going to have engaging presentations at every level of this organization. And we will always sacrifice the one for the many. We will never sacrifice the many for the one. You know what I mean by that? What I mean by that is, well, Lucy's been doing, you know, the teaching. The, Lucy's been doing the lesson for children for four or five years, and she's not that good, but we don't want to hurt Lucy's feelings. Well, look, there's 45 kids in there. Let's hurt Lucy's feelings instead of hurting the 45 kids' view of God. Let's sacrifice the one for the many. That's what Jesus did. That's in the Bible. Sacrifice the one for the many. So we decided... At the expense of hurting feelings, wrecking people's careers, and making women cry, we are going to sacrifice the one for the many. We will not have subpar presentations. And when we made that commitment, the presentation level started going up. And guess what else happened? We began attracting better presenters. See, pre presenters are kind of like band members. If you're an A-level guitar player and you're listening to a C-level band, and the C-level band says, hey, we need a... Guitar player, the A-level guitar player is going, I ain't playing with you. I could, but I'm not. Why, well, you're not up to my level. See, whatever standard of excellence you adopt as a church, that's who you attract. You'll attract that, that good and not that good, but you generally don't attract better. So you just make the decision, we're going after excellent presentations, and you will begin to attract better presenters. I'll talk about a little bit more about that in just a second. Uh, let us see. Generally speaking, it's the presentation. It's the presentation that makes information interesting. Generally speaking, it's the presentation that makes inter um, information interesting. If you have ever sat through a boring lecture, it may not have been the content. It was all in the presentation. In fact, I guarantee you, it's in the presentation, because we have all heard people make completely irrelevant content interesting, because they were so interesting. What makes content interesting isn't the content. It's the presentation. Um, every time you go to a restaurant, you order, you know, if you're going to order some sort of meat, you order beef, you order chicken or fish. What makes it interesting, what makes you come back to that restaurant every time, isn't that they have like a, they have crocodile, deer, and elk. 
It's the presentation of the beef, right? The chicken or the fish. Presentation is what makes your favorite food your favorite food. It's not the food. I mean, a carrot's a carrot. Potato's a potato. A hunk of dead, you know, cow meat's a hunk of dead. It's just, it's just, that's, that's the content. It's the presentation that makes the difference. And the same is true in terms of teaching and in terms of creating environments. Um, I wrote this in my notes that an audience's attention span is determined by the quality of the presentation. That's just the bottom line. The, the, the audience's attention span is determined um, by the quality of presentation. The other great illustration of this that you can all identify with is comedians. Have you ever gone to a comedy show or watched a comedian on television? Of course you have. Or been, you know, live, seen a live presentation of a great comedian? They can talk for 45 minutes. They have no point, no application, no scripture, and the time goes by that fast. There, nothing they say is either true or necessarily relevant. Why? Their presentation is so good, you're completely engaged. So this myth of, well, people have a shorter attention span. Are you kidding me? How long was Lord of the Rings anyway, right? <laughs> and then they did the, you know, the director's cut, and everybody had already seen it and watched an extra 45 minutes of the movie. The attention span has nothing to do with this. It is all about the quality of the presentation. We've decided to create a great ministry environment, engaging presentations, appealing setting, engaging presentations. Letter D, engaging presenters require engaging, pre excuse me, engaging presentations require engaging presenters or an engaging means of presentation. The reason I say that is that many of us now are doing video preaching, video teaching. I mean, our student ministry, we're doing more and more video preaching and video teaching. We've learned, and I have three teenagers, that high school kids actually pay better attention to a video screen than a live presenter. So when we videotape our presenters and we get the best presenter who does the best job and does as many takes as he or she needs to, and then we edit it perfectly and distribute it to all of our student ministries, the kids are more locked in. Why? It's a better presentation. It's not even live. But that's just what works for them. So it's not simply a, the best presenter. It's the best means of presentation as you think about specifically what you're trying to create, what you're trying to communicate. The other thing we've learned along these lines, and a lot of you are all over this, is that there's a difference between, there's, sometimes it takes two different kinds of people. There are great content creators, and then there are great presenters. Now this, is, this will really help you if you can figure out how to get this into your system. We've been doing this for years. It's made all the difference. So giving a great presenter great content creates a great presentation. Giving a pre great presenter an assignment to go make a great presentation and the assignment to come up with their own content, that's often a recipe for disaster. They're interesting, but nobody gets anything out of it. At the same time, if you find somebody who's got great content, but they don't have great presentation skills, the content may be very, very important, but people are bored out of their mind because it's the presentation that creates interest. So what we've done at every level, including Sunday morning preaching, is we have developed people and found the teams of people who are great content developers, great content ideas, and we've married them to our best presenters. And consequently, we get, their, we get much better presentations. We're able to take people who don't necessarily want to work with children, but they're great presenters, and we just allow them to present material, then we get them out of there as soon as possible because we don't really want them around the kids. No, just kidding. In other words... <laughs> So what happens is, what happens is, you do a general call for, we need volunteers in our children's ministry. We need volunteers in our middle school ministry. And there's some great presenter out there that spends, you know, four or five days a week making presentations, and they're thinking, well, I don't really like high school kids. But they're an awesome presenter. And so you find out they're an awesome presenter, and you say, hey, look, here's what we need you to do. We're, we're not asking you to, to serve in high school ministry. Here's what we're asking you to do. If we gave you 20 minutes of really good content that you liked and could embrace, would you get up in front of high school kids and use your presentation skills to just teach the big idea? And then we're going to break up in small groups and discuss it. In other words, we're asking you to do what you do well. Present. And here's the idea. Well, here's the big idea. You know, we, this is what we want you to teach the kids. Your friends determine the direction and quality of your life. That's it. Your friends determine the direction and quality of your life. Okay, that's our big idea. Now we need two illustrations. Here's the verses we want you to use. We've got an outline. Could you do that? And the presenter's going, oh yeah, I could do this with my eyes closed, one hand tied behind my back. No problem. And you take a presenter who could care less about high school kids, and I'm being facetious, you know. But all of a sudden, they're in their zone. I'm a presenter, and I got a microphone on, and somebody's giving me great content, and they're all over it. And then it's over, and they feel like they've been successful. And they decide, hey, I think I like high school ministry. No. 
You like operating in your gift set. You like operating in your strength zone. We just happen to put you in front of high school students. We have found so many great people with great ideas that never want a microphone, and we've found so many people who are on stage, they come alive, but you don't want them to come up with the content. But when you begin to marry those two skill sets, your presentations, they go, they go way, 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 way up. So we have people who do, are, do the master teaching in children's. They'll do the master teaching in middle school. They'll do the master teacher in high, in high school ministry. They don't care. Just give them a microphone and a good outline. They're just good at it. And they're not volunteers in any of those areas of ministry. We just know they're great presenters. Why? Because we want great, engaging presentations. So here's your questions to talk about later. Is your culture characterized by a relentless commitment to engaging presentations at every level of the organization? Or are you just being nice to people? Well, she's always done it. He's always done it. No, he's not all that good, but we just love him. Well, again, if you're just trying to be the Methodist church that's getting the Methodists moving in your community, not a big deal. If you're trying to attract people who are outside the local church and you're trying to get them to think, oh my gosh, I'm so glad I went to that and I'm glad my kids are here, then you may want to think about it. Number two, does your system allow you to put your best presenters in your most strategic presentation environments? That's huge. Does your system, the way that you operate, allow you to get your best presenters in environments where they're doing the presenting? Number three, are your presenters evaluated and coached? No, we don't hurt any feelings. <laughs> I'll tell you a story in a second. Does your system create opportunities for your best content creators to partner with your presenters? In other words, this is all about creating a system where you're able to marry these two skill sets. When I first went into ministry, I went to work for my dad, and I inherited the youth group. And they hadn't had anybody in a while. <clears throat> and um, so I would walk around. It was a Baptist church, Sunday school, little classrooms, little high school kids all spread around, high school and middle school. And I would walk by the classrooms, and I'd stand outside and listen to these teachers do the lesson. Oh, it was awful. You know, some of them were really good, but most of them was terrible. So I thought, what am I going to do? I don't even know these people. I've just gotten here. I'm the preacher's kid, so they expect me to do something stupid. And so, you know, I, I, what, what am I going to do? So I came up with this idea that I don't recommend necessarily. I decided we we're going to have teacher evaluation in Sunday school. Okay? So I told the leaders, I said, hey, next week, uh, here's what we're going to do. I have an evaluation that I'm going to have all the kids in our Sunday school department fill out on you. And you can just see the blood, you know, drain out of their face. It's just some questions to see how you're doing, how they like you as a, as a Sunday school teacher. Because, see, here's what I had to decide. Am I committed to adults who want to teach high school kids Sunday school, or am I committed to high school kids? So I decided I'd be committed to high school students. That was my job. And I was a preacher's kid, and it's my first job. I didn't know you weren't supposed to do that. So I came up with this evaluation. I just made it up myself. And here's the part that got them. At the top, the first thing was, you know, we want you to write down the name of your Sunday school teacher. And I wrote, if you do not know his or her name, write a description. Because I thought, you know what, I bet some of these kids don't even know their teacher's names. Because they're so non-relationally connected. Well, we passed that out, collected them, then I had a teacher's meeting. Every one of our 45 Sunday school teachers showed up for that meeting. And I had a stack of evaluations. I said, now look, some of you are going to quit. Some of you need to quit. You do. Some of you are going to want to quit, and I'm not going to want you to quit because I can help you get better. And some of you need to teach the rest of us how to do this. And you know what? The ones that needed to quit, they already knew they quit. They didn't even want to read it. It's like, I, you know, this isn't what I've just been doing this because you needed somebody. It's okay. Never mind. I got to go. <laughs> they self selected. <laughs> but my point is this hey, why would we want to bore another generation of students with God's Word? Do you know why 2018 to 23-year-old, 24-year-olds don't go to church anymore? Because they used to go to one. They've been to one. It's not like they're going, church, now what's a church? They're going, church, oh yeah, let me tell you. And you know what's interesting? Nobody has ever sat down with a leadership team at a church and said, what can we do to run off all the 18 to 25-year-olds? Anybody got any ideas? But they've accidentally done church in such a way that ran them all off. So you've got to decide. You're going to sacrifice the many for the one or the one for the many? If, if anyone's going to stand up and present the truth of God's word, it needs to be the best that you can possibly do. And I don't mean they have to be super talented, but as you think about your, your, your pool of people, your presenters, who's the best? And what can you do in your system to adjust the system to set them free? Number th Roman numeral three, real quick. 
You've got to have an appealing setting, engaging presentations, and helpful content. Helpful content. I'm not talking about true content. I'm assuming it's true. You've got to go beyond true and make it helpful. By helpful, I mean letter A, useful. Useful, 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 useful. Jesus said this at the end of the Sermon on the Mount, his most famous sermon. Therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice. Why? Because he said, I just gave you some useful, helpful content. But you're not going to know what's useful or helpful unless you do it. To understand why I said what I said, you got to apply it. If you don't apply it, you'll never understand why it's so important. Helpful content. Let it be helpful content is content that directly addresses two things, thinking and living. Helpful content always addresses one or two or both of these two things. Thinking, here's how to think differently, or living. Do you know why, you know, well, that's too long of an illustration. Basically, you know what I want my, my high school kids here, the high school kids here to understand about sex and premarital sex? I, I want it to go beyond living. I want them to understand how to think about sex. And so here's what we teach here. Purity paves the way to intimacy. Purity paves the way to intimacy. The reason you don't want to be morally pure is you don't know what's at stake because you're thinking incorrectly. See, one day you're going to want to have intimacy. Purity paves the way to intimacy. I want you to think different about sexuality. Now, there's some things you can do and can't do. We're going to talk about the, the, the behaving, but I want you to learn to think. So useful, helpful content is content that always addresses. Here's how we think about it. Here's what we do about it. Letter B, helpful content. Uh, excuse me, just did that one. Letter C, content should be age and stage of life specific. Oh, I could spend a lot of time on this, but I won't because you're smart enough to get this. Um, content should be age and state of, stage of life specific. Reggie Joyner, who I mentioned earlier, he used to say this, had this statement that we all just copied and we say it all the time, that all scripture is equally inspired. It is not all equally applicable. All scripture is equally inspired. It is not all equally applicable. I don't care if my kids understand the book of Leviticus, Numbers, or Deuteronomy. But I want to go to that passage about choosing friends, and I want us to teach on that for eight weeks. Then I want us to teach eight weeks on moral purity, and then I want us to go back and do eight weeks on friendship again. And then do eight weeks on moral purity, and then let's go back and do eight, you know. I mean, there's some things that we want our middle schoolers to not miss, high schoolers to not miss, children to not miss. So what we've done, some of you have done this, is we sat down and asked the question, what do children need to know? Let's design all our curriculum around those four things or three things. What do our high school students and middle schoolers need to know? Let's design all of our curriculum, all of our camps, all of our content around those seven things. We call them our seven checkpoints. Purity paves the way to intimacy. intimacy paves the way to, purity paves the way to intimacy is one of those. What do our small groups need? What do, what do married people need? What do er, newlyweds need to know? What's the needs to know? Then why don't we just teach those things over and over and over to that stage of life as long as they're in that stage of life? Why? Because that's helpful. And it's, if it's helpful, that's going to fuel their spiritual growth. Um, number one, and two, and three under uh, letter C. Information that does not address a felt need is perceived as irrelevant. Information that does not uh, address a felt need is perceived. I say perceived because it might be very relevant. But if it doesn't address a felt need, it's perceived as irrelevant. Have you, did your parents do this thing with you where they made you learn how to change a flat tire before you'd ever had a flat tire? My parents didn't either. My, my father-in-law, he's great. He told Sandra before she ever drove out of town, she had to like, go outside and get the jack out and change, the flat, change her tire. Well, do you know how relevant that felt, having never had a flat tire? Totally irrelevant. It was relevant, but it was perceived as irrelevant. But once you have a flat tire, learning how to change a flat, all of a sudden, it's so relevant. So the problem is, until we learn how to connect content to felt need, it feels irrelevant to people. Uh, number two, information that isn't perceived as useful is perceived as irrelevant. And number three, irrelevant just doesn't stick. So here's your questions. Is your content helpful? Not is it true. I know it's true. It's the Bible for, for the most part, right? Is it helpful? Does it address somebody's thinking, somebody's living? Do your content creators and communicators understand that the goal is renewed minds and changed behaviors? Is your content age and stage Specific. If you have curriculum and the goal of the curriculum is to get your kids through certain parts of the Bible, that's not a good curriculum, probably. You need curriculum that is designed around what kids are living with and doing and how they're conducting their lives every day. Because all scripture is inspired, it's not all equally applicable to every stage of life. So the three questions we ask, three questions you can borrow and adapt, are simply these. Was the context, was the context appealing? 
Was the setting appealing? Was the presentation engaging? And was the content helpful? Those are the three questions we drive all of our ministry environments through. You can use ours, you can come up with your own, but the bottom line is this. Give your staff, give your volunteers a map to go by so that everybody is evaluating ministry programming the same way so that you can have a win.